Thank you so much. This is my first time at this conference, and it's, uh, it's been incredibly informative, and you all are so welcoming and interesting in your research, and I'm very thankful to be here talking to you today. Um, you may notice that I changed the title of my presentation. Uh, in the um, schedule, it says former offenders, and here I've written returning citizens. And I always say former offenders when I apply with abstracts or grants because then people know who I'm talking about. If I say returning citizens, people do not know what I am talking about. But this is the um, less offensive term for uh, people who have spent time in jail and prison and are re-entering our communities. Um, so in a nutshell, 20 minutes, I'm a bit of a talker. I'm going to do my best to cover all my points, but essentially I, I want to achieve two things today. I want to describe an environmental justice population, a transportation disadvantaged population to you, so that when you go out, you urban planners and engineers, uh, you, you do this really amazing research, and I, I hope that you will keep this population in mind, uh, because their transportation disadvantage translates into reincarceration in their lives. So for most of us, being delayed on a bus um, will not result in being fired. Um, maybe it would, but it certainly wouldn't result in returning to prison. And those are the stakes for this population. Um, and, and the second thing I want to do is describe a project that myself and Dr. Mattingly and our colleagues at UT Arlington are um, just really starting um, to try to make the lives of returning citizens in our community in Dallas County just, just a little bit better if, if we can. Um, so to begin with, I, I find when I teach about mass incarceration, who are these returning citizens? How many are we talking about? Th the best thing I can do is put it in a global perspective. So here we have incarceration rates, um, which are 698 people per 100,000 in the United States. This is actually down slightly from the last few years. Um, but as you can see, compared to other wealthy, democratic, first world countries, we incarcerate, ironically, the land of the free incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. Um, the land of the free is the land of the locked up, unfortunately. I put this up, this is women's incarcer incarceration rates, also a global comparison with the, the same group of countries. It is also off the charts, and I put this up to remind myself to tell you that within the justice-involved population, um, this group since 1980 has experienced a 700% increase, women, in incarceration in the United States. So it is not actually our stereotype of uh, someone who is locked up, but that is the reality. There are many disparities in the criminal justice system, uh, and, and I, I really don't, 20 minutes wouldn't cover it if I were to go into all the details. So I put up this slide. Obviously, on the uh, left-hand side is our general population and percentage by racial and ethnic group, uh, and then the correctional population on the right-hand side. Um, the Native American statistic is slightly off because this excludes tribal jails and prisons. So that is actually an over-incarceration that is larger than what you see here. Um, the Latino population has a, a little bit of a, a disparity. Of course, the most egregious disparity is among black Americans um, who are over-incarcerated compared to white Americans. Um, and what you find, the disparity in the criminal justice system occurs from contact it with the police. So uh, a, a, a black man is more, much more likely to come into contact with the police in the first place. Once in contact, they are much more likely to be arrested compared to a white counterpart for the same crime. Uh, once arrested, they are much more likely to uh, be sentenced than their white counterparts. Once sentenced, they are much more likely to have a longer sentence. And this translates into the correctional population being so disproportionately black and male. However, I want to emphasize that if I'm going to describe this group of people, they are not just black and male. They are exceedingly poor. 60% of this population are functionally illiterate. 
And in case you, you're not familiar with that term, functionally illiterate, that means they cannot read and write to a degree where they could hold a job. So when you're looking at a, at a prison, you're not just looking at males and um, black folks, people of color. That is not who you're looking at exclusively. You're also looking at extremely undereducated people. You're looking at extremely poor people. You're looking at people with addiction rates about 75% of the, of the correctional population is suffering from an addiction of some kind. About 75% are suffering from mental health problems. So in social work, which is my field, we always say most of our mental health clients are locked up. The second largest mental health institution in, in our state of Texas is the Dallas County Jail. That's our population. So there are many, many disparities. When we think about justice-involved people, there are two big pieces of this pie. One are sort of the bright colors on this slide, and those are people who are in jails and prisons. Um, and that may, there's roughly 2.3 million people that are actually detained. The others, and probation and parole, which is over 4 million people, are the folks who are trying to make it in society. So they have been through the courts and the jails and the prisons, and now they're back to us. They've served their sentences, and they're back in our communities. Those, that's my population of interest today. That's who I'm talking about. Because it's not static. You can't imagine that these are the people in the community and then there's the people walk, locked up. It's what we call a revolving door. Because roughly 65% of all these people are, and if I can just sort of say it sort of quick and dirty, this is guns and drugs. These are not people who run guns or um, distribute drugs in large quantities. These are folks with possession charges. So a lot of these are possession charges. And a good hunk of those are actually accessory to possession charges, which means, for instance, let's say I go on a date with somebody I've never met before, and he picks me up in his car to take me to a restaurant. I get in that car. If that man has three joints, in the car, I don't know him, I've just met him. He gets stopped by police, they find those joints, they arrest him for possession and they arrest me for accessory to possession because I'm in the car. So our laws are very, very draconian. Um, this means there's a bit of a revolving door. For anyone with an addiction, once you get out of the Correctional Institute and things are pretty rough, you turn to your drug of choice to ease your pain a little bit, and then you picked up for another, another possession, and you go right back in again, right? So it just, they just sort of revolve around. And what I hope to do, and what we hope to do with our project, is to, to help them, just give them a little bit of a leg up on the outside so they don't turn to drugs, so that they can make it. And transportation plays a critical, critical part in their lives. So, I couldn't find any fancy slides to talk to you about the complex reality of their lives, so I think I'm just going to sort of say what, what it is. When you are released from jail or prison, um, it comes with conditions of release. And this is about your conduct on the outside. So very typically they'll say, you must live in an appropriate place. In other words, you must live in a place. You cannot be homeless. That is not cool. Um, there are often obligations related to your mental health or your health. You absolutely have to get to the methadone clinic. If you have an addiction, very often there will be drug testing. You must get to this facility to have a drug test so we know you're not using. You must find employment. Sometimes they say, well, we know it's really hard to find employment, but you must try and you must have sort of a documented, um, documented effort, let's say, at finding a job. So the cost of not meeting those obligations is re-arrest. So when I tell you, and I, I tell you this, this is, this is the stat, 68% of people who are returning citizens will be re-arrested in three years. That is not necessarily because they commit what we think of as a crime, but these obligations then become potentially criminal if they don't meet them. 
if that makes sense. So if you and I don't meet our obligations at work, maybe we get reprimanded. If we miss a doctor's appointment, maybe we pay uh, a cancellation fee. Nobody comes to arrest us. <laughs> but unfortunately for these folks, that is the cost of not meeting those obligations. So meeting them is critical, absolutely critical. And as you can imagine, running all over town involves transportation. When people exit jails and prisons, literally when they walk out the doors, it is not like the movies where somebody hands you your clothes that you wore coming in and your wallet and your wedding band. They throw all those things away. So when you return out of, when you come out of jail and prison, they hand you clothing which may or may not be weather appropriate and you have no ID. So even if you have a bank account with $50, $100 in it, you can't get to that bank account. They also let you out in the middle of the night. So I'm just gonna, just gonna keep going here. Um, so in an attempt to help Dallas County returning citizens meet these obligations, Dr. Mattingly and myself, and a lady from criminology, Dr. Jaya Davis, um, we, we are very thrilled to be NITSE funded and we are attempting um, a, let me go to the next slide. It's a mixed method study. There is a quantitative portion, and I'm quoting Dr. Mattingly here, facility location problem structure to formulate a strategy. Uh, essentially, the way I understand this as a social scientist is, we're trying to optimize or minimize the travel time they have between those obligations. Because that's what fouls them up when they can't get to all those obligations, the frustration. Um, and I'm going to let them describe the returning citizens' voices themselves. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let them describe those transportation um, challenges in detail to you in just a, a minute or two. This project has a bottom-up approach. So rather than just Dr. Mattingly, who can imagine these obligations and can look up what they are, um, modeling them. Uh, myself and the social science team are going to interview people. So we've set up a technical, technical advisory committee which consists of re-entry folks, people who work first, first they're frontline workers with returning citizens, helping them arrange their lives, um, with transportation experts, with the hospital, the mental health hospital where most of our returning citizens go. Uh, we are going to talk to those frontline workers and employers because there are employers in communities who are willing to, to hire folks. And as you can imagine, having employment is pretty key to getting to, to a successful reintegration. And we're also interviewing returning citizens. In preparation to do that, we did um, a review of the literature, of the qualitative literature. What are the experiences of returning citizens around the United States with respect to transportation. Uh, and this is a fairly common um, qualitative synthesis of, uh, or a synthesis of qualitative research is a fairly common um, technique that I use. It, it captures a picture better than just talking to five or 10 people as some qualitative research projects do. Um, we only found 12 sources. One of them is actually not an article. This is a mistake. Um, the sources reviewed were 12. One of them is a dissertation from MSU. Uh, and then we analyzed this using uh, cloud-based software. So first of all, there's only 12 studies found that even talk about transportation as an issue for this population. Only one of the 12 even focused on logistics. The others, I just had to sort of read, you know, read through all these quotations and find references to transportation, and I want to contrast this with what we call the lay knowledge, the clinical knowledge. People who work with this population know this is a huge barrier to success, and yet the research is, is not there. Um, and notably, uh, it, it, there's sort of a very recent interest, so half of these sources um, were published in the last five years. Almost all of them collected their data via interviewing returning citizens themselves. Tell me about your life. What are, your, what are the barriers that you've experienced? Those kinds of questions. One of them notably was an ethnography. Um, and for those of you unfamiliar with that, um, it, it comes from sociology and anthropology and it involves the researcher kind of hanging out with people um, and also reproducing. What she would do is interview people and if they said it took three hours on a bus route, she would take down all the details and then she'd get on the bus route herself at the same time of day and test it. 
to, just to see how that worked out. Um, so the most common codes that we found were that public transportation takes a lot of time. And you might say, yes, well, of course it does. You know, any, I mean, I used to ride the commute by bus and streetcar and walking in the city of Toronto to get to work, and it did take a lot of time. Um, but as I say, the stakes are higher, and they are often time constrained, these folks. Transportation creates tremendous challenges in meeting those obligations. It's a barrier to meet those obligations where it really needs to be a facilitator. They cannot afford the bus. Most of these folks are taking the bus. And the bus is not a very expensive <laughs> mode of transportation, but it is too expensive for these folks. They have an immediate transportation need. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that for a second because I'm going to read a quote to describe that need and how dire it is upon release, like the minute you walk out of a jail. It's not safe to walk. This means two things to these people. I can't afford the bus. It is not safe to walk. Because imagine where you put halfway houses in your cities and communities. Where do you put the shelters? Where are the methadone clinics? They are not in the neighborhoods we live and work in. They are in not so great parts of town. So to walk instead of taking the bus, while it might be doable, is a very, very unsafe prospect. And the other part of this is even when they can catch the bus, waiting at the bus stop is dangerous. Coming home late at night from a job at 2 a.m. as a woman and walking to the shelter is a dangerous prospect. This is the quote I'm going to read to you. The daily head count for prisoners was taken at 12.01 a.m., one minute after midnight. If an inmate is eligible for release, he or she is held throughout the evening until the official post-midnight count takes place, and then they are released to the streets. Damn, it's pretty bad, that area around the jail, Anita said, that she walked out of the jail into the middle of a crowd of pimps, drug pushers, and thieves. No buses run in that area of town until after 5 in the morning. You got no money, no place to go, you don't know anybody. What do they expect you to do? You want to turn around and go back in the jail. This is not like the Ocean's Eleven scene where Clooney comes out of the, with his friend waiting in the car. This is not that scene. This is the common scene. This, is not, this, this research was not done in Dallas County. I know for a fact Dallas County does this. They do this in Toronto to people. This is common. So as you can see, the stakes are very, very high to run through that gauntlet. I just read a, a, a research report recently that said amidst the drug dealers and the pimps are also traffickers, specifically sex traffickers waiting for the women who are released from jails because they know how vulnerable they are. And it, they can say, hey, don't listen to these guys, these guys, these, they're trying to take advantage of you. I got a job for you in Oklahoma. And how many women would say, yes, okay, just get me out of here. Get me out of here. This is a fancy little thing that we do not have time for. I was just pleased that my software did this. Um, so some of the themes, well, you know, when we get all these codes, we try to interpret it, boil it down, collect it, see the patterns. Uh, and this is by far the most important thing I want to convey to you, is that these obligations that these men and women face are so intimately linked to transportation. Um, if we can maximize the efficiency of their transportation, more people will have a shot at staying out of jail. They need your help. Um, so I chose this woman's one quote because she just summarized her life in such a beautiful way. And this is a, a woman, a returning citizen. She said, I start my day running to drop my urine, drug testing. Then I go see my children. And she's probably working very hard to get her children back. If you spend X number of days in jails consecutively, you will lose custody of your children. Um, so then I go see my children, show up for my training program, look for a job, go to a meeting, Alcoholics Anonymous, show up at my part-time job. I have to take the bus everywhere, sometimes eight buses for four hours a day. I don't have the proper outer clothes. I don't have the money to buy lunch along the way, and everyone who works with me keeps me waiting so that I'm late to my next appointment. If I fail any one of these things, and my PO, my probation officer, finds out I'm revoked, by that she means probation will be revoked, 
she will go back to jail. I am so tired that I sometimes fall asleep on my way home from work at 2 a.m. And that's dangerous, given where I live. And then the next day, I have to start over again. So it is no wonder that people, 68% of these folks, land right back in jail again. How long could you sustain this? Another theme are, the challenges are myriad. Um, so I just chose two. One of the questions is, some of these folks have access to a car. Maybe they have family members who have a car. But of course, to drive legally, you need a license. And you absolutely cannot be caught driving a car without a license if you have a record. That's not going to go well. It's going to go much better for me than it will for them. So uh, one woman says, I see women here who want to get their license, but they're too scared. Many of them still owe for traffic tickets, and they don't have the money to pay for these tickets. So they are scared that when they go down there to get their license, they're going to be arrested, so they don't go. Of course, having a car, especially in Dallas County, which is patchwork transportation at best, um, that might give you access to better jobs. So it, sometimes they make these really tough decisions. It's like being between a rock and a hard place. Do I drive a car without a license and hope I don't get caught, but it'll get me a job that pays me better, and, and, and then, then maybe I can get an apartment and I don't have to live in the shelter. This is a bit of a trade-off. Another person says, due to the small number of bus passes we obtain, the director of this agency has cut off people who come from halfway houses and try to keep those bus passes for the homeless and people with less resources. So being in a halfway house is being too resourced to actually qualify for the free bus pass. So you can leave the halfway house, but then you're in violation of your obligation and could be arrested. But then that would give you the bus pass to get to work. You see how it, it, there's just absolutely no good way for them to move forward. So the third theme are sort of the losses, the, the, the doors that are closed because they just don't have adequate transportation. I was working in a job that I was able to get. I made less than $200 a month. Just think about that for a second. $200 a month. I quit the job because the pay was so low and I lived so far away from the job. I ended up spending my salary on bus fare, cab, or paying someone to take me to work when a family member was not available to take me. Another person says, my case manager recommended school. I wanted to maybe take up solar panels. It's the new technology now. But it was far away to school, so I couldn't go because I didn't have a ride. So we're excited about this project. I'm extremely excited about this project. We've partnered. We have a community partner called Unlocking Doors. They're a reentry agency, um, and we are going to pilot our output and hopefully help those caseworkers make decisions about where to shelter people, where to recommend that they go. We're also hoping that, that this research will, will help from an urban planning perspective. Um, where would you put a new shelter in Dallas County where it would minimize the travel time for these folks? Um, where would Parkland Hospital, who serves so many people in their mental health needs, where would they put a satellite office to minimize the travel time for these folks? How can we help them make it on the outside? Um, it's going to be a very interesting challenge. Certainly, Dr. Mattingly and I have a very good professional rapport, and we're going to have to sit down and I'm going to have to translate what the returning citizens are saying to me and sort out how he can use that in modeling. And that will be very interesting. And Maybe next year, if I'm lucky, I can come back and we can talk about how that went. Um, but that's what we're hoping to do. Um, and, and I hope that when you do the magical things that you've been doing and describing to us here in the last few, well, in the last day, that you remember these folks, because these, so, these people are so vulnerable. And they really do need um, your assistance. Thank you very much.